join us this new year for new conversations at the Commonwealth Club. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us for Inforum at the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm Michelle Miao, host and producer of the Michelle Miao Show and also a member of the Board of Governors for the Commonwealth Club. I'm so excited and so pleased to be in conversation with Terry Cruz, who's here to discuss his new book, Tough, My Journey to True Power. Terry's career has taken him from the NFL to starring roles in TV shows like Everybody Hates Chris and Brooklyn Nine-Nine. His memoir, Tough, explores his inward struggles with how to live up to society's view of masculinity and how he came to understand what true toughness actually means. If you're joining us live on YouTube and would like to ask Terry a question, you can do so by submitting your question through the chat box, and we will try to get to as many of them as we can. Terry, thanks so much for joining us this afternoon. All right. Thank you. How you doing, Michelle? I'm doing great. I'm doing so good. I love this book, Tough. Oh, it's awesome. I want to thank you so much for, for Tough, your book. I mean, my graphic is kind of taking your graphic out, but uh, we'll, we have it all here. Uh, awesome. My Journey to True Power. <laughs> I enjoyed it so much. I read it in a day. I even watched um, some of your movies, at, like White Chicks. I watched it last night. So thank you for it. Yeah. So, you know, many people during the pandemic, they did their thing. You know, some people came up with some creative stuff. You, you wrote a book, it sounds like. <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, you know, what was uh, really crazy, I actually, well, you know, we started to do the, get you know, everything arranged for this book right before the pandemic hit. And so much changed in two years. Um, the book had several different directions, you know, uh, and it, it, in a way, we kind of made five books in one. We dealt with all these different subjects because we were trying to figure out we couldn't do it linearly and all these things that really, what I call the intersectionality of everything that I've been through, it just one thing touched on another that touched off another. And um, I just, I'm really happy with how it turned out, especially now with, uh, you know, it looks like um, we're, kind of seeing the light at the end of the tunnel with this pandemic, but that two years was what I needed to really bear down and get this thing done. Um, you know, cause it was really hard to get out and do our thing. And um, it was really cathartic in a lot of ways. I was like in continuous therapy throughout this whole two year period. Yeah, I was just about to say it was therapy. Well, let's get into it. Your memoir touches on toxic masculinity, and I'll read a couple profound quotes that I took from the book that I feel needs to be in more conversations about the root cause of such toxicity. There's this quote, the economic crisis and the racial crisis precipitated a masculinity crisis. And then in feminist circles, phrases like patriarchy and male privilege and toxic masculinity have gotten played out almost to where you roll your eyes every time you hear them. Yeah. But whatever jargon you use, the issue that's really at stake is the abuse of power. I believe this to be so true of society and that toxic masculinity or whatever you want to call it, isn't necessarily just about men, but there's so many layers to it. So tell us your definition of toxic masculinity. Yes. Um, again, I, I just want to reiterate, you know, it has been misused in a lot of ways that phrase toxic masculinity and i've always kind of straightened it out with if you can you can get it if you just say abuse of power and uh, a story that i like to tell that really kind of summarizes what it is is imagine you have a restaurant and the restaurant has a rule where you have to wash your hands every time you know if you work there you have to wash your hands every time you go back to the kitchen or use the restroom you have to wash your hands well, the boss of the, the restaurant, whoever owns it, comes in and you see him go to the bathroom and he leaves without washing his hands. And everyone in the business sees that. Everyone notices it. Everyone says, oh, my goodness, like, uh, you know, this guy's not following his own rules. And slowly but surely, you know, people are starting to question, you know, what what the business is, what what, what the restaurant's doing. And all of a sudden, 
people start to the manager, every, the, 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 all the employees go up to the manager and say, Hey, can you confront the boss? Can you please go and tell him, Hey, he's going to have to wash his hands when he goes to the restroom. Well, the manager does that. And the, the boss fires the manager. Okay. Now everybody gets the point. Everybody goes, okay, you can't confront this guy about, you know, he's not even obeying his own rules. And, and he's, he's literally sending the message that if you even confront him about it, you're going to be gone. So everyone remains silent. No one says anything, but they all go home and tell how this restaurant is disgusting. <laughs> and they say, wait a minute, you know, the boss doesn't wash his hands. The word gets around. All of a sudden the business goes down and everybody wonders why this once wonderful restaurant is not going, is, it doesn't exist anymore. And the boss blames the employees. He's like, hey, it was them. They didn't do their job. They didn't do the thing right. This is what I'm talking about. This, this whole thing, it's so toxic because you, you learn that you can't even say anything to people like this. And I had become this person is what I want to say. It, it was so wild. My family, my wife, uh, people around me were telling me, um, hey, man, you're, you're not doing these things correct. But the problem was I was very successful. I was the boss. I was the guy who had the money and who had the, the ability to tell people what to do and all this stuff. So I wouldn't listen. And when I tell you that it was, it's an abuse of power. It's when you can, and it, just because you can, you do, but that doesn't mean you should. And I'm trying to tell you, it was a, the light bulb went off for me when my wife basically said, that's it. I've had enough. And I just was like, wow, like I, I couldn't get it because I was like, hey, wait, I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do in this male culture, in this male world. I really, I ticked all the boxes. I did all the stuff, um, you know, and it's, it, it was really, really jarring. The only way I could really describe it is to, is to think that the sun revolves around the earth and really believe that to your core. And then to find out the next day that, no, we go around the sun. <laughs> what? You know, it, that was my whole, it was, when I say a, uh, it, it, was, it was just like this big eye opening experience that I couldn't, it was a revelation is all I could say. And that meant I had to revamp everything in my life. Just knowing that we go around the sun changes everything. You start to learn about every, you're like, wait a minute, everything I, th I thought was wrong. It's like, you know, literally believing the earth was flat and you go, wait a minute, you know, all these things. And once you get the right way, understand the definition and of the problem. Now, now we can deal with answers and deal with solutions in the right way. Well, before you get to that moment, right, the, the D-Day, you, you called it, in this yeah. moment of transformation or knowing that you need to transform, there was a whole lot of abuse of power in your life. And you yes. detail that in your memoir, uh, starting with, you know, trauma you faced with your parents, um, yeah. such as the relationship that you had with your dad, his alcoholism and his physical abuse uh, yeah. with your mom that you had to witness. So, why don't we, you know, talk a little bit about, yeah, the relationship with your dad and you know, yes, go ahead. No, yes. Uh, it, it was, you know, I, this is one thing that a lot of people, I think they don't understand is that you come into this world, you know, because we live in the United States, this is why we speak English. But if we grew up in Mexico, you would probably know Spanish. Um, and th these things, you know, you don't automatically be born know are knowing a language. These are things that are taught to you. And the language that I learned was that men were more valuable than women simply because they were men. That was the culture I was in. That was the environment. And, you know, by my father knocking my mother out, I was like, hey, man, it's, it's your way or the highway. There is no other, you are the boss and I get it. You would rather be feared than loved. So I'm not even going to worry about loving you, but I'm going to fear you. And for a lot of men in the era that I grew up in, being feared was absolute, it was actually preferred to rather be, because being loved was actually seen as being weak. 
It was seen, if everybody liked you, you must be a mamsy pamsy pushover. That was the, the, the terms that they would use. But if you're feared, all of a sudden, everyone will respect you. Everyone will listen to you. Um, and so it was an, everything was all about the iron fist. And I learned that very, very quickly. And, and what you're also talking about is a very competitive world. Um, when I, where I grew up, the drug dealers were competing. The gang members were competing all the way to the NFL where the athletes are competing all the way to Hollywood where the actors and performers are competing. And what this does, it can create, creates comparisons and comparisons literally make you, they make you dissatisfied with anything you have. And I had this competitive mindset where I had to dominate and anything um, from, you know, any slight, any disapproval was seen as, you know, paramount to sacrilege. And I was, I lived my life like it was a revenge movie. It was about getting people back, anyone who ever doubted me or degraded me or, or, or whatever. It, it just became where this fantasy of I'm going to be successful just to show you. And it's very, very motivating, but it leaves you with within a shambles. Um, you know, the things that work in the NFL on the street, they call it road rage. It's so wild. Um, and I couldn't turn it off. I was full of rage. A lot of these things I learned simply because it, my life wasn't working the way I wanted it. It, was, it would be a tantrum. My answer to everything in my life was like a chess game, a chess match. And if I didn't have a move, I just turned the board over. That was the, that was the answer. And that's a lot that, that, that really related to a lot of what is the toxicity that was around me because that's all I witnessed were people turning the chessboard over. And that's the answer. And I had to find another way or I was going to die. Yeah, and then, um, I'll be honest with you, get very personal right now. I, I don't have, I didn't grow up with a lot of, you know, male figures. My dad died when I was very young, two years old. My mom didn't remarry until... I went to high school and then I came out as LGBTQ. So I really didn't have, you know, male figures around me then. Um, but it was hard to understand men, men in general in my world. When I read your book, you know, I got this, I had this sad feeling because I never really got the chance to connect with my stepfather. And for the reasons that he just never shared much, we didn't connect. Mm. There's this vulnerability in your book. You share so much truth and honesty and you know, all these things that people would think of as failures. They would just wouldn't think to share the ugly part of their lives, right? Mm -hmm. And I just think that you know, as we're able to share these things, we can understand one another more, especially men and especially when we're talking about something like toxic masculinity. Mm -hmm. I'm curious to hear what other folks might have said in reaching out to you that you know, perhaps that they appreciated you being vulnerable, that, you know, that in itself is power and more men can be vulnerable, that we, we should embrace that. You know, yeah, this is where, um, and thank you for sharing that, Michelle, because that is, it, it really was my goal of the book to get, you know, people who wouldn't understand this type of behavior and this mindset to kind of at least look at it and say, oh, wow, this is, this is the connection of the dots because these kind of things, you can't blurb them, you can't tweet them. You know, these, these are only through nuanced conversations. And, uh, and thank you for, for even sharing your own personal story because that is amazing. And that is what I am encouraging. Like, you know, the thing is, is that when I was young, I asked, I asked, any man in my life. I said, man, what is it to be a man? Could you please define it for me? And all they told me was, you're going to find out. And I was like, I'm, a, I'm 12 years old. I don't, I don't know. You need to show me. I mean, I'm looking to you to show me. So it was so bad that I made a pact with my best friend that I said, hey, man, if you find out something that I don't know, please promise you tell me. And if I find out something that you don't know, I promise to tell you. So, you know, here I am with my best friend. We're the same age. We're co-parenting ourselves. 
because the men in our lives were silent and they were quiet and didn't say anything. And the reason I knew that this book had to be as transparent as possible, and I mean, get down warts and all, was so that people could understand and get the answers that I was seeking for when I was a kid. Like that, the whole book is basically a letter to myself at 12 years old. That's what tough is. And it's like, ask, it answers every question I had about who I was going to be, what I'm about. Um, and I can honestly say this book is as thorough as it gets because of the transparency. And I'm so, so thankful because this is another thing I would never recommend that people go public about their private issues, as, especially as deep as I did. But, but the issue is, and the thing is, and the wonderful skill that comes with this is that I'm already in the public eye. I'm very, very used to, you know, even in performances, you have to be extremely vulnerable, you know? And so I was kind of, I've been wired and prepared and all the therapy and the years of going through these things, I was prepared to do this. And, you know, but again, I would never just recommend, but I do recommend that someone find some, a loved one, a therapist, uh, someone that they love and trust and who loves and trusts them that they can share their heart with um, and really, really get real. I have to say, the person who saved my life in so many ways was my wife. My wife's true honesty um, really saved me. Um, and I just, I always felt like this kind of honesty is healing. And again, this is why the transparency, the vulnerability, and it was hard to, to write, <laughs> okay? Just reading it back, I was like, oh man, I am really telling all everything. But then there's a switch. All of a sudden it feels relieving. It feels like, oh, okay, that wasn't that bad. And you start to realize, and then when I got the words back, and people were like, I'm going through that too. That's me. I went through the whole thing. And it just it started to make me realize that people weren't feeling alone when they read the, read the book. And um, it, it's I'm so, so happy and honored because I think truly that this may be the best thing I ever do in my entire life. I mean, beyond entertainment, beyond sports, beyond all this stuff, this kind of message it carries on and on and it'll be here long after I'm gone. Yeah, I agree. I mean, you know, when I picked up the book to prepare for our talk, um, I did ask myself, what could Terry Crews and I possibly have in common? And there's a lot, there's actually a whole lot. And I'm probably, you know, where you were at uh, the moment in which, you know, I, you, I think you were um, mopping up a floor for a, a temp job after right. the, you know leaving the NFL being broke nowhere not not knowing what to do where to go and your life totally changed I think I'm, I'm my life hasn't changed yet but hopefully after reading your book I'll have a different mindset right mm -hmm. um but going back to the book and you know this book being open and honest and vulnerable and you share your your transformation I don't think it's just your transformation but you also bring up the work that you might have been doing before you actually did your own work. And I mean that by, for example, you talk about the experiences in the NFL. And I'm just going to read a little bit from this page. But you say, I can't speak to what the NFL is like today, but the NFL I knew was like prison with money. Right. So what did you mean by that? And if you could give us some examples of how not being able to show signs of weakness was traumatic and abusive. Well, wow. Wow. Um because the NFL runs off this, these challenges, this male pride, um, where everything, you know, if, if you have, the, again, I got to give another story to, to help illustrate this. It's like if, if, if guys were on, the, on a beach in California and, and, and there were a ton of alpha males and all of a sudden one guy goes to three others, he says, I bet you I could swim to, to Hawaii. And the other three says, I bet you I can beat you there. And so all four jump in the water and start to swim. And they're out there and one of them wins. Like one of them is a mile out. 
The other two are losing. They, they're tired. They can't make it all the way. And But slowly but surely, they all drown because you can't swim to Hawaii. And that is the picture. That is the, it's like, why are you getting in there in the first place? Why are you taking these challenges? And it's the myth of, of invulnerability and the fact that you're a superhero and you, nothing, bullets blaze off you. And it's funny because even when I suffered my sexual assault, there were grown men telling me that I was too big to be assaulted. And I was like, but that's like saying you're too big to get shot. What does that mean? I mean, literally it was the same thing. It was like, you're, no, you're made of steel. That shouldn't happen. That you shouldn't even have felt when he assaulted you, you shouldn't have felt it. And I go, but that, that's not true. Um, and these are the fantasies and the thoughts that, that drive the men in the NFL. When I say prison with money, these guys are in there and they're the alphas up on the alphas. If the NFL team went to prison, they'd run it the next week. Um, we were there. I was in there with drug dealers. I was in there with rapists. I was in there with pastors. I was in there with every kind of guy who really was like, you know, and they were the alphas on everything. And it was all about competing and beating everyone else around you, which when, and what I like to say is a jail mentality. You know what I mean? Because it's almost about who runs the jail, who everyone has to answer to, and who has, it, it's always a power struggle when you're talking about that. But when I switched into a collaborative mind, a creative mind, not the, com not the competitive mind, I learned that, hey, all of us guys need to actually sit there on the side of that beach and we need to create a boat. And we need to have one guy run the engine, the other guy who makes the food, another guy has the map, and one guy is steering. And we can all get to Hawaii now. You know what I mean? And now we're all together and we're all safe and we're, we're working together. Um, the NFL doesn't do that. It's really, really, you know, you're on the same team. And you're really waiting for your friends to get hurt. So it's because that's your opportunity. And I realized I said, I didn't even like football. Um, but this competitive world, I, I knew, I said, if I'm going to be in it, I'm going to have to embrace it. And it made me mean. It made me arrogant. It made me, it, it really cut off a lot of my empathy and emotion because you can do very, very cruel things to other people when you feel this kind of rush of, of alphaness is what I want to say. And um, you, you can become a bully very easy. And you can see it happen very, you know, very quickly, especially with kids who've been abused before. And it's their attempt to gain some sort of power. And I was that man. I asked myself, you know, after reading that, why, why Terry, wouldn't have thought like he could you know speak to the NFL today because I feel much of what you share is continued I wonder if you think that perhaps you know by talking about your book by talking about your your experiences in the NFL that you could be an advocate for change you know for yes. well, first of all, I, I mean I for the NFL at least yeah no I do in fact um it's, it's kind of wild because the NFL has a very tenuous relationship with me you know because they, they like the fact that I, I've made it out and actually have done very, you know, gone and done good things. But I'm, I'm like, my wife was with me, I'm very honest with the NFL. And I say, hey man, these, you know, NFL players don't live long lives. I've played with players who committed suicide because what's happened is they become their wins. They, they literally have, have, they have equated their ability to play football with their worth as a human being. So when you're really good, your worth is off the charts. This is why they can be super arrogant. This is why I was super arrogant. When I was in the NFL, it was like, I'm better than everybody. But the problem is when I got cut, I was lower than, than a worm. It was now you're worth nothing. And my the watershed moment and the thing that I always tell all these NFL players, in fact, we had some NFL players on AGT who had formed a choir. It was amazing. And one of the things I had a chance to talk to about 50, about 30 of these players. And I said, hey man, the, the watershed moment for me is when I realized my worth as a human being 
had nothing to do with wins and losses and the ability to play football at all. And they all nodded their head because they were retired players. And they were like, I know, I know. And we all had this kind of like, you know, this moment together of realization that, you know, it's kind of a trick. And, it, and if you fall for it, you you will literally, you, you'll be stuck in the spinning, in the spin cycle, like I like to call it. And now I also look at the UFC and I look at how these guys are going in there and, and you know, just given their bodies and their brains and this in the CTE and all these things and other people are profiting uh off of the, off of these guys fighting and who knows where these people will be in 15 years that's the only thing we don't know and in 20 years you know there's gonna they're gonna have to really really rebuild themselves and find ways to cope when this stuff is over yeah yeah I, I just feel like there needs to be somebody who says something more and, and that shows care for these young men and oftentimes, you know, young men of color, black men who, yep. whose lives are, you know, cut short, whether they're being accused for assault, rape, or, you know, reckless behavior. I mean, these things are happening more and more, especially under social media. Yes. Um, so that's what I hope is that, you know, this book can, can go the distance. I love football. But I do think that the NFL should change. <laughs> you know, listen, and the thing is, is sports in the right context is great. Sports is wonderful, but it's almost like anything. I mean, money is a great thing, you know. If but when you abuse it, and when you when you twist it, and you all of a sudden you have a, a lust for it, and you you're willing to do anything for it, it's going to twist into a whole lot of wrong things. I like to say it's like electricity; it can give you great toast. Or it can in your life instantly. You know, I mean, you put that fork in the in, in the socket, it's gonna be a wrap. You know what I mean? So we have to understand what we're dealing with. And you understand the power that you have. And this is why I call it true power. You know, that was the term that I really felt described what happened to me in changing because it really was about the power to control yourself. I had no control before. I had not. You could bait me anything. If a white guy called me the N word, I would just. I the rule is that I was supposed to knock him out instantly. And that, and and I'm trying to tell you, in black culture, that's the rule. With black men, if if any white guy calls you the N word, you knock him out. But the problem was, is that that's bait. That no one. You're just the guy that's running around knocking people out. And no one understands the whole story. And so many young and old black men have ended up in prison and in jail for doing something overboard simply because they couldn't control themselves. And the thing that hit me is that I realized, and when I started to examine all these things, that there are no N words. Like no one is an N word. Um, it's that that thing that hit me. I was like, I'm I'm a human being. I. I had to increase the value of my humanity. And all of a sudden I, I wouldn't be insulted anymore. But that takes therapy. It takes a lot. I mean, in a lot of ways, I realized I was like a child who just didn't understand. And then you have a tantrum, you know what I mean? Um, but once a child understands, he grows and he learns and he matures. And I feel so, so thankful. I cannot tell you because I, I, I was literally a 40 year old child for a long time. It's interesting, you know, um, the day that you decide to deal with a very serious situation differently ended up being a situation that changed a lot of people's lives. And I'm talking about the uh, sexual assault situation. Uh, but before that, right, you your reaction to a lot of things in dealing with your anger would be, uh, to beat up somebody, uh, beat right. up your dad, you beat up the guy cat calling your 15 year old daughter, yep. nearly beat, you know, some, some guy who'd pushed into your, your pregnant wife. Even um, my but, dog. <laughs> yeah. So your dog, your dog crazy. who crazy, poop. crazy. Yeah. I mean, I, I listen, I'm so, it, it, again, it makes me cringe. I, I, yeah. I even cringe talking about it now because it's just like, what was that? Like, and I couldn't control it. Like it, it immediately, when, when, it, when it happens, you regret it. This is why I understood Will Smith uh, at the Academy Awards. And I said, I was there. I did worse than Will. 
you know, and someone disrespected my wife and I put this guy up, picked him up and put him on his head in the concrete. And you have to understand too with men, you know, we, we can push and, and move our way through strength. And, and we, that's the way we get through situations. And one thing I love about the ability that women have is that women have, women most of the, t- of the time think their way through so many things and it creates wisdom. And everything in the book, every last thing that I learned, all the great things my wife told me first, but I just didn't listen because I felt, I felt because I was a man, you, should, you know, I'm the man, I should already know this. So I discounted all her great advice, all her wisdom, all the things. And she was the one who made me promise to never get violent, promise that we would walk away because she, she's like, you're going you're gonna to either at the minimum, you're going to get sued. And at the maximum, you're going to die because you're going to come up against the wrong guy. And I'll never forget, she was pregnant with my son at the time. And she was like, you, do you want to see your son grow up? Do you want to be here for him? Because if you do this, I can't see you in our future. And wow, wow. It, it was all wisdom all the time. And she said all these things. The time that I was sweeping the floor, she was saying, I need a job. You need to get a job, you know? And, but it was these, these barriers. I even had a barrier to therapy, you know, in my culture. It was literally, therapy was equated to quackery. It was viewed as the, the term everybody, everybody used was you can't cure crazy. And what I say the one thing black men need more than ever is therapy because there's probably never a group of people who've been through more trauma, you know? And it's something where the people who've been through so much don't get what they need. You, you're talking about an endless cycle. You know, black men make up 6% of the US population and they're over 40% of homicide victims. I mean, come on, there's, there's, there's something wrong here that we have to change. And I would have been one of those statistics, probably easy. Yep, you're absolutely right. Um, I want to go back to the sexual assault situation because by that time that you you reacted differently, right? Even though this guy physically violated you and it's this high-powered Hollywood man, um, but you, you reacted differently. You did not beat him up. Well, I had already spent years in therapy, which was amazing. It, uh, probably going on seven years at that time and had been, re, you know, my wife and I, after we broke up with all the therapy that I went, she decided she could give me another shot. And it was so great because we were really, you know, starting a new path. It was like, we got married again, you know? And so we went to this party and you know, you, it's, it's wild. It's kind of like, you don't know when your test is going to come. You know what I mean? You had no, it's kind of like all that therapy and all that stuff. This is why you got to do it continuously because if you lag or whatever, you could get caught on the wrong day, you know? And I was constantly into reworking my life. And here was the head of the motion picture department of my agency comes over to me and I don't know what he was on. He certainly wasn't drunk because I know what drunk was, but it was something else. And he came, he was manic and sticking his tongue out and came up and grabbed my privates. And I'm like, yo, get back. Hey, hey, you know, and I'm jumping back and he laughs. Then he comes back and grabs him again. I'm like, yeah, get away from me, you know? Now, my wife looks at me, I look at her. Let me tell you, we all know how this story usually went. And first of all, I'm, I wouldn't be honest if I didn't say the instinct to immediately put a hole in his head was right there. And I was like going back into old things like, all right, this guy, he's got to learn his lesson. And then it hit me. And I said, I don't have to do that. I don't have to do that. I know who I am. I know my value. Because all of anything, one thing I realized is that a lot of offenses have a lot, a lot, any offenses that I'm taking have more to do with me than they do with anybody else. You know what I mean? If I feel inadequate in any way, that's the only way it would hurt me. And I realized when he did that, I was like, this guy 
It's just, I counted it all to ignorance and all to, uh, you know, bluster and arrogance. And I went, got my, grabbed my wife's hand. We got in the car and I went home and my wife, the whole time, she was saying, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. I'm proud. She kept repeating it because she knew I needed to hear it. And what was so wonderful because she knows what I what I would have done. She's been on the, the other end, the police coming and and she was like marvel, like I think she was marveled, marveling, like, I'm so proud. Like, look at you. You are walking away. I know what you could have done. And we handled that the correct way. Um, we ended up suing the agency and and what was so wonderful about that whole thing is because I ended up joining the women of the Me Too movement who really inspired me so, so much because they inspired me to tell my story um, and their courage. And they just, you know, because a lot of people don't understand, you know, you don't, you don't get paid for telling, you, you get paid for silence, you know? So a lot of, everyone was calling those women like they were going to get this big payout and the whole thing. I'm like, you, once you tell it, nobody, you're not getting any money. You know, once you come forward, it's not, it's, there's no money to ha be had. And these women were just putting it on the line and they were being debased and dogged out. And I said, and I felt like I would be a farce if I didn't join them because I said, this thing happened to me. It happened to me. And I went right in. And again, that was the result of all this therapy. You know, if I hadn't worked out these things in my head, I, the, what made me tick, I would never had the courage to come forward. But because I was honest with my therapist and finally got and started to understand what made me happen. I, and, and what was so crazy is I understood what was wrong with the, with the agent. Because if I recognized his thing, you know what I mean? And I was like, oh, that's what that is. That's that toxic masculinity popping up. The thing where you can get away with it. You're the boss. You don't have to wash your hands, but everybody else does. And I said, that's what I recognize. I was like, there it is. And it was so, the, the answer came so clear and so bright and so right. I knew I could battle it. Now I was on and the highlight of my life was going, was having that Senate hearing with a Miss Amanda Wynn for the Sexual Assault Survivors Bill of Rights. And I could feel the millions and millions of people, men and women, who never had a chance to tell their story. And we turned what was what was normally called a female woman issue into a humanity issue. It became 2D and it went to 3D. And uh, I, I really, I'm just, I'm so, so thankful to Amanda and, the, and the, all the women in the Me Too movement. It was, it was watershed. Yeah. Um, in your book, you talk about, you know, understanding now that that true power and it's about how you respond to the injustice that is pretty much always going to, to be there. Right. right. And um, my question to you is, you know, throughout the sexual assault situation and sharing that and then being able to remove this toxic person, this abusive person in Hollywood, and then, you know, even you shared the experience of, of um, approaching Adam Sandler about a character in a script that you didn't agree with. You felt, you know, it was racist yeah. to sharing your experiences in the NFL. Um, have, you, have you included that in your recognition of your own power that you're able to really affect and change so many other people's lives? Yeah, you know, I, I love what you just said, you know, justice is really rare. You know what I mean? Like some, when you look at what, what justice is, it's just, there's so many people who get dogged out, you know, I mean, over millennia, you know, this, this thing is never settled. It's not a score to be settled, but you can get freedom, you know? And for me, you know, it, it, knowing that justice was rare and you, it might happen, it might not. And if it does, it's, it's a celebration, but, if, but most of the time it doesn't. But I knew that I could get freedom and by standing up for myself and all of those cases that you mentioned was a, was a case of me being free. You know, it was a thing where 
I didn't judge myself by their standard. I had my own standard and I could really back my own standard up. And I could, I had the confidence to tell, uh, you know, Sandler and everybody about how I felt about this role or to stand up against, you know, William Morris, the biggest agency in the world, you know? And I knew, I said, man, this is, this is what freedom is like. You know what I mean? Even, even if it, it even if it, you get it or not, because if I didn't get it, then but I'm still just by standing up and just by saying something, you gain a measure of freedom. And it's I just want everyone through to look at the story in, in my book and really see how much power you really have. Because that was another thing. In all those cases where I wouldn't have said anything, I never really truly realized my influence and my power. And, and I, I think you and everybody else in this world has way more power than they could even, you know, recognize right away. But once you see it, oh man, there's no going back. Uh, audience questions are starting to flow in. So I'll go ahead and ask my last question for you, Terry. And again, thank you so much for sharing your stories and for this book, Tough. Um, and so we talked about power. We talked about, you know, struggles with anger and masculinity and our views of it as a society. In the end, there's what I feel reconciliation, the top of topic of reconciliation. Right. Um, and you end with, you know, the sharing about your parents. So if you could share with us, you know, your, your thoughts on how the work has to continue, you really have to continue working on yourself and reconciliation can be a part of that. Yes, you know, reconciliation is the theme of my life. Um, my wife reconciled with me um, once I took accountability uh, and, you know, we were willing to, to work it out. And reconciliation doesn't always mean all agreement, but it does mean that we are going to, to, to make a new life together. You know, it's about inclusion. It's about collaboration. Um, and it, I like to, it's almost like, uh, as, as opposed to competition where it's about beating other people, reconciliation is just about working together. I mean, that's, that's what it is. It's like, hey, I'm on this side of the house. I have the kitchen. You have the bathroom. We agree that you can use the kitchen anytime you want. And we agree that I can use the bathroom anytime I want. You know, it's kind of like this really working relationship. And I came to that, those terms with my parents because we didn't agree on a lot of things, you know? And, he, and what was wild is my father didn't spend a lot of time in denial and it was, it was hard because he wouldn't, uh, you know, he felt like he was being singled out and the whole thing. But when he, it, hearing me continue to talk about this stuff, he finally came to me and was like, hey man, and this is even after the book was written. He's like, you know, you, you were saying the right things. You, you, you basically, you know, I was lying to you. You know, the times I told you I wasn't drinking, I was drinking. And it's just like, oh my God. And then my mom, we, we came to terms before she passed away. Um, through all my therapy, I was forced to confront some things that she did that were, that were abusive. And she came back and wrote me a letter and just said she was sorry. And, and we all worked it out and, and she wasn't perfect. And, but it, we came to a really great reconciliation and a new stage in our relationship before she passed. And that's the story. I think reconciliation is the number one word for me right now, because you need it between black and white, uh, Republican and Democrat, male and female. We need to reconcile and, and work together. How are we going to work together? Love it. Uh, we got a question here from an audience member. What's the biggest lesson you learned from fatherhood? Oh, man. The, you know, what's so great about being a dad is, you know, I, I realized that, you know, I needed one and I didn't have it. Again, I was asking. I was to the point where my father, he begged, you know, he didn't say, you know, I begged him to tell me what, what things were and he wouldn't. And to be that person for my own kids is one of the best things ever because they have questions and they have things. And, and, and I, 
all my strength is to protect and to build. It's not to to threaten or or beat or anything like that. And I know my purpose as a dad, which is so wonderful. And you know, a leader is actually the greatest servant. He's the guy. Like it's my job as what you would call a father to make sure that my wife achieves the goals that she wants to achieve and that I help her do these things. I help my kids. They tell me what they want and I help them to achieve that. And that's the, like knowing that is now that I know what true great fatherhood is all about, it's perfect because it's not about what I want. It's about what they want. It's about getting them to the goals and supporting them in every goal and every thing that they want to achieve from my wife all the way down. And this has really healed our family in a lot of ways because the first half of my life, I wasn't like that. I was too hard on the kids. The first two kids, you know, it's, it's like a different Terry Crews. I, it's funny because I ask them, I'm like, how much, how much money you want? I was like, you can get cash check or credit card because the damage that I inflicted, I was so hardcore about everything i was i was never in because i felt that's what being a dad was it was about being strict and you know just never you know never yielding and you got to do this this and this and this and or you're not gonna or you're gonna fail and it was just horrible and my first two daughters i still constantly apologize and, and try and and i'm constantly trying to make amends with my first two daughters um the bottom three kind of got the new terry cruz you know what i mean so it, and and i love my family and they've been very very gracious to me during this whole time and super gracious second question sports is a, is great for promoting self-reliance and teamwork the toxic part i believe comes from the combination of capitalism and sports mm -hmm. players then change from people to a resource to be used is this how you felt i know the answer to this but <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean i i did i mean it's 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 really one of those things where you know I, again when you're talking about capitalism you're talking about competition in, in a lot of ways i mean that i guess that word can be you know interchangeable in, in a lot of ways um because this this the need to compete you know one thing people don't know and i'm about to give a little secret out you know about the nfl you know the the competition is an illusion um all the teams share the revenues the nfl is one company and what you have to understand is that that company has different divisions it's the washington commanders you have the new england patriots you have the phoenix cardinal you know all these are just different they're, they're it's in the same company and the illusion is that they're fighting for a winner but they all share the revenues, which means there's really no competition. It's kind of like, it's, it's to get you going at it and all this stuff. And it's a way to make, it's kind of like um, I learned at Procter & Gamble that the Tide and Cheer are owned by the same company, <laughs> you know? And the, 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 the myth of I'm a cheer person. Nope, I like Tide. That sells more soap. And it's part of the whole thing. And like you said, that's capitalism right there. Uh, and so I don't, I, I look at the whole thing. I think, again, if it's, if it's kept in its right perspective, it stays fun because it should be. I realized I didn't like football, but I did like playing all day outside with my friends. That's what I loved. So that's the kind of the difference uh, in what I realized. So now I can do some badminton with some guys and I'll be fine. <laughs> I love that. I'm sorry, my, 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 my wife got a new puppy, so he, 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 she's going to be yelping through this whole thing. So if you hear it in the Oh, back. Terry, it's the new <laughs> norm. But uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I hope the puppy is um, does not eat poop. Yeah, no, 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 it's uh, all good. <laughs> all right, cool. Okay, next question. What is the best piece of personal and professional advice that you've received? Who is it from and how did it help you shift your perspective? Oh, my my. The, the advice that I gave a little earlier about my friend telling me, hey, man, I can't promise you you're going to get your wife and family back, but you have to get better for you. Um, and you have to understand, too, in the world of masculinity, 
you do everything for rewards. Everything is for a cookie or a snack or a positive reinforcement. You know what I mean? But to, you know, this is where the, the, the father tends to, or the guy of the house tends to say, okay, not me. I don't want any of that. Um, you know, give it to them or whatever. And he won't take, he'll, he'll act like it's, um, it's all about everyone else. And the thing I learned is that just to get better for you involves really taking your own time, like self-care, which to a guy, it seems selfish. You know what I mean? Like, oh man, I'm not going to spend any time in therapy or going to, you know, sit, sitting down or working out or, or really taking my time to, to meditate or do anything like that because I got to go to work and I got to do this and I got to do that and the kids got to do this. And what happens is a guy will work himself into an early grave when he should have taken his time. A lot of times I have to even count it to where guys feel selfish even going to a doctor and they'll spend years without going and doing checkups and doing all these things and won't do it at all. And then they, and all of a sudden they get a diagnosis and it's too late that it's something they could have taken care of a long time ago. And this is where it, you have to get better for you. I like to say that every human being comes into this world assembly required. It's, it's, you don't come into the world automatic. You, like I said, your things are learned, things are given to you. And there are things you got to weed out. You got to just say, wait, that's not, I'm, I'm going to take the good stuff and I'm leaving the bad. There are a lot of things in my culture that were so bad. That I was like, you know, I look at hip hop culture, you know, I love hip hop, but there were so many things I was like, oh no, no, like that is so wrong. I got to throw that part out. You know what I mean? Uh, and you have to take the good. Um, we come assembly required. And once I knew that, it gave me more power to change the way I think. Because if you can change the way you think, you change the way you feel. And when you feel better, it changes what you do. I'm going to jack that assembly required. Uh -huh. How has Hollywood responded to your book and your message? Have any of the reactions surprised you? Uh, you know, it's funny because this is not a Hollywood book, you know, and a lot of Hollywood has kind of stayed out of it, so to speak, um, simply because it's, it's more a humanity book. You know, I, I think that a lot of people wanted this thing to be funny anecdotes and funny movies and different things, you know, stories about this on the set and stuff like that. And, and that was the right time for that. But this, it got a lot deeper than I think anybody ever realized. Um, so, and I understand, you know, because Hollywood is a little bit, and this is one thing that uh, uh, Sidney Poitier said, which blows my mind. And I, a lot of people don't realize. He said, art does not solve problems. Art highlights them. It puts a spotlight on them. It dissects the problem, but art never solves the problem. And I'm like, oh that's entertainment. It's art. It highlights issues and you see it, but it doesn't solve it. And this is where I look at the book as being a bit past Hollywood, you know, whereas it's, it's not about a narrative and a story that you can get a message from. It's a little bit about like, wow, this is going to help you examine yourself and tie in and hopefully it can really make you look at yourself a little bit differently than you've ever, ever looked at yourself, which could be all, could, which could make all the difference. We have time for maybe one or two more oh, questions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'll take this one. Loved you on the show, finding your roots. <sighs> and I have so much respect for you. What was it like being on that show? First of all, being on that show changed the directory of the book um, because Henry Louis Gates, Jr. went 200 years into my past and found the family that owned my family. And I mean, it, and he said it was super rare as a black man to be able to get back that far. I mean, to before the Civil War and my family, you literally were separated and found each other again, reunited after the Civil War and changed their name. It's one of the most beautiful stories in the world. And, and remember, like I said before, even about culture, 
It's about leaving the bad and taking the good. On my father's side, my father, my grandfather, however, was, he was a prisoner in a chain gang and worked the, the, the you know, worked in the fields of Georgia on a chain gang as a prisoner. And he had robbed some places and did some bad things. He had abandoned his family. And what we do culturally, we tend to only take the bad stuff. And we say, yep, that's us. But I decided to take all the good that had come from my family. I, we had businessmen, we had wonderful people who just really just were super, super amazing. And I talk about them in the book. My, my great grandfather, Claude Smart, who I say left me a, an amazing inheritance. And because he was so, he used to teach the black kids that, and black kids and, and soldiers that came back from the Korean War. He taught them how to read and write and math. And in this little town of less than a thousand people, he was so honored. And that was my grandfather, great grandfather. And I said, I'm taking that, you know? And when I got my star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame last year, my grandmother, who's 94 years old, she's 95 now, she was 94 then. She looked at me and she said, you are just like Claude Smart. She said, oh, we just, everything about you, I see Claude in you. That was one of the greatest, greatest thing, greatest compliments I could ever receive. It's incredible. Is there anything that didn't make it into your book that you wish did? Hmm. No, I, I, I think it was as thorough as it could get. <laughs> you know, when you get a chance to read it, I think you'll say, oh yeah, you put everything in there. Um, you know, I think that there may be another book in a few years, uh, just talking about other things that as they happen because life keeps happening you know um I don't know what's what's the future for me I don't even know if I'll be acting in the next five years I just don't know you know when I left football it was like no man's land um and even with with acting I switched over to hosting as well and now hosting AGT is so amazing it's wonderful I don't know what's next um and that's the fun part. You know what I mean? I, I learned to live in the uncertainty, which is a really fun place to be. You know, it, it can be really cool. So I, there may be another book coming. What advice do you want to pass on to your children? The biggest thing I like to say for them is that you can't love someone and control them at the same time. All my, everything that was a problem for me was my attempt to control people but you have to love them. You want, I want every relationship in my life to be voluntary. Um, it's gotta be where anyone can leave at any time, you know, and no one feels trapped. No one feel, I, you wanna be with me because you want to, because I add something to your life because I'm a benefit. And you, you have to be that to other people. You know, um, if you're trapped in your job, it's, it's a, it's a horrible job, but if you love your job, it's like you go to work, like just happy and ready to be there. And so the love and control can get really conflated sometimes. And, you know, people say they love you, but they're really trying to control you. And I was guilty of trying to control my wife as opposed to loving her by giving her this image that she was supposed to fall in love with when that wasn't the real me. And it was all, it, it created a lie. And that's the big thing I, I want my kids to understand and value um, that in, they don't want anybody around them that doesn't love them. And they shouldn't be around people that they don't love and they shouldn't be trying to control anyone either. Would you say the same uh, for advice about marriage? Uh, absolutely, it, it kind of <laughs> goes right in there you know i mean and all of it and all the relationships and as they get closer and closer and more loving you know like i said you have your kids and you have your wife and family or, or to, to anyone who has a husband it's really about that freedom you know to to because if i had my wife locked up in a basement is it love <laughs> you know what i mean it's kind of like but what if, but the thing i value more is because when I did my work and I worked on myself, she came back because she had the choice. And she said, you know what? I see you, you're different. 
I can give you another shot. And our marriage, we're going on 33 years this year. Um, and this happened roughly, all the D-Day happened about 12 years ago. And I can say we are better than ever, stronger than ever, and more in love than ever. Um, I wouldn't wish, I wouldn't, I'm so glad that happened because it's just saved our marriage, saved our life. And now we're going on into eternity together. I love that so much. I forgot to tell you, I, I have so much respect for your marriage and uh, I love the strength of your wife. And thank you for including, you know, all the stuff that you learned from her, which, which made the book. She is the best. Yeah. I'm trying to tell you, like, I, <laughs> I, 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 she needs a book is what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that might be the next book. It'll be just her. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, what's been your favorite acting experience or crew you've worked with and what made it special? Oh, first of all, it's like having a favorite child. You can't, everything has been wonderful for different reasons. You know what I mean? So I, I, you gotta understand, I'm living a dream every day for 20 or 23 odd years since 1999. I have been living a wonderful, wonderful dream. And again, I was, even with all this crazy stuff that I'm telling you, I was very successful. And there was always moments of great, great joy um, and honor and being there. I, it was just a matter, I had to get my personal things together. I, my internal success had to match my external success or it was gonna fall. And I'm just thankful because that external success is a dream. I am living a dream and it's wonderful. And last question for you, and actually it is for me. So I lied when I told you I had one last question, <laughs> uh, but this is a fun one. It's a fun one. And I mean, I loved you in White Chicks. And to be yeah. honest with you, you know, I grew up in Stockton, California, very similar to um, the neighborhood that you described, mm -hmm. you know, Flint uh, gang members and the media made us fear black men, uh, yeah. especially big black yeah. men, right? Yeah. And so seeing you and that and your character really made me feel like somebody lied to me about black men being so scary mm -hmm. um and then you know that's that's a serious side but the fun side is that i also you also made me actually like vanessa carlton's song <laughs> so, <laughs> also, like, i love vanessa you know she hit me up yesterday i mean oh nice i nice. love vanessa and she so the question is do you, can okay. you can you still sing the song? Can you still do that whole oh, scene? Making my way downtown, walking fast, faces pass, and I'm homebound. Do -do 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 -do. <laughs> I love, well, you have to understand too, I, and, and what's so great is that's me. Like when everything is right and going and, and everything is wonderful, I'm free. I am free to be funny, free to sing, free to have fun with no judgment and just straight creativity. And when people saw me in that movie, you watched a free, I, I was a free man because it was awesome. And I mean, those guys, the, the Wayans brothers just gave me all kinds of license to just be me. And it shocked everyone. I mean, what was wild is that people were like, whoa. And I like to say, you know, my goals changed from trying to be the best into being the only. And by that, you, you, you don't have to compete. There's no, you don't have to worry about capitalism or competition or anything. Just be the only. There's, that's it. There's no, nobody to compete against. It's not, now you can collaborate because you're the only one. Well, Terry, we love you. And thank you so much again for, for tough, uh, my journey to true power. So if you haven't already picked up your copy of the book, please do so. It's available now. And I promise you, you learn so much and it could possibly change your life like it has for me. I'm going to go home and I'm going to call my stepfather and I want to have a one-to-one -one conversation. Uh, Terry, thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you, Michelle. This is, this is powerful. Thank you, thank you, thank you for, letting, for giving me this space and this platform to share my heart. We'd also like to thank all of you for joining us uh, for this special program, for watching and participating live. If you'd like to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making virtual programming, please visit commonwealthclub.org online. I'm Michelle Miao. Thank you and stay safe and stay healthy.